Hey guys, thanks for coming. My name is Jason Felix. I'm a software engineer at Beamery. And this is Nick Johnson. He's the front end lead at Beamery. And he's going to start you off. Hi, folks. How are you doing? You can keep that. Um, <laughs> I've got one here. So um, this, is, uh, this is a slightly different talk. We're going to be talking today um, about micro front ends. So uh, these, are, these are microservices, but running in the browser. Um, uh, which, is a, which is a technology which we're using here, and we'll explain to you over the course of this talk why we're using it and why we think it's the right thing to do. Um, this is a talk in two parts. So uh, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to Jason. He's going to talk about uh, Beamery and the monolithic architecture that we started with, effectively, of one big app. Uh, and then um, I'm, I'm going to take over, and I'm going to take you through the, uh, the tech. So we're going to look at the, uh, the architecture of the thing, and then we're going to go down into the code. Um, does that sound okay? Brilliant. All right. So I'll hand over to Jason. Here we go. Hey, guys. Uh, so Beamery. Beamery is a talent engagement platform. So it allows you to connect to um, your candidates and helps you keep track of um, their performance, um, take notes, and basically just maintain a healthy relationship with them. Um, so the monolith. So Beamery 1 is built in Angular, and it's a monolithic application. So it's a single TA application. Uh, this means that all of the components in this single application here is all in Angular. Uh, so if we wanted to um, migrate to a new framework or something, it's kind of impossible to do with just one of, like, just a single application. Um, after Series A, when we moved on to, like, when we were whilst moving forward, um, the aim going forward to Beamery 2 was to move towards um, a new framework. Either that or upgrade to um, something like uh, Angular 5. The reason we don't, we're not too sure about doing that is because the path to migrate into Angular 5 is not as easy as migrating um, just to a new framework. So um, ownership. Ownership is extremely hard when you've got one single application. So, um, if you've got a team working on the title bar, the mid, the, the main grid, the sidebar, or the nav bar, um, it means there's a, a, there's a high chance that um, the teams will cross, cross, like step on each other's feet when they're pushed into a single repo. So, um, say for example, you've got somebody working on the the grid, and you've got somebody working on the nav bar, and they're using the, they use the same store. Um, if they're pushing code, they, mo they may both um, change similar parts of it and it will make it awkward to um, like have to merge them together and things. Instead of doing that, um, if you could somehow build an interface and let them um, communicate with each other separately, that would be a lot more um, efficient. Um, also, Angular 1 is a very old framework and um, developers hate old frameworks. Um, I know I definitely would not want to be working with um, exclusively with Angular 1 now. Um, I always want to try out the, new, the newest things. Um, and also, horizontal scaling is very um, it's difficult. So when you've got a single, single tier application, it's much easier to just scale upwards instead of scaling horizontally. This isn't necessarily a good thing at all, um, and it's something we wanted to avoid. So what were our options? The first one was to throw away our, um, our, first, uh, our first application. Um, the problem with this is that we'd be wasting a lot of working code, um, which is something we did not want to do. The second option, like I said before, was to um, upgrade to Angular 5. Um, this is also not something we wanted to do because not a lot of people want, not a lot of engineers um, want to work with Angular 5. Um, we'd much rather work with um, React, I think a lot of us. Um, it's also too cumbersome to migrate. So migrating, I think Google thought it would be very easy to migrate, and that's what they, they were kind of saying it was, but it's a lot, lot harder than they, they said. Um, the third option is micro front ends, is what, which is what we use at Beamery, and it's awesome. So what's a micro frame, um, front ends? So basically, they're, they're microservices for the front end. Um, this means that this component, this component, this component, and this component are all different applications, and teams can work on them completely separate to, uh, like, independently of each other. This means uh, a, a team working on this and a team working on this can have a meeting and say, okay, we want 
this to communicate via an interface, and these are the props that you need to pass down to it. We can deploy this separately. You can um, build it and run this locally independently instead of having to have everything in the same application. Uh, this allows you to modular, modularize your code and run the applications um, independently as well. So again, uh, this allows you to future-proof your code, which means uh, you can build um, any part of it in whichever framework you want. If a new framework came out next week, you wouldn't have to use uh, uh, Angular. You could use, I don't know, React 5.0. <laughs> um, and also, it stops code conflicts and keeps new developers interested. So how does it work? I'm going to pass it over to Nick. Cool. So as Jason says, uh, we started out with a monolith, single large application, as most people have. You, 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 have, you build your application as, as a single application. You pick a framework, in our case, AngularJS, which was cool at the time. I know it's not cool. Um, <laughs> And um, then you build it. Um, and, and of course, what you do then is gradually, over time, that application becomes old. So then you throw the whole lot away, right? Which sucks. It's stupid because you're throwing away a bunch of working code. Um, uh, so what we've done instead, as Jason says, is we've, uh, rather than building, rather than extending this old application or throwing it away and building another one, we've just built a second application next to it and another one next to it. So this is, this is, how, uh, this is how a typical web application works, right? You have a DOM. This is a simplified DOM here with HTML and the body element. And then we've got a div. So you get your div and you give it an idea of app or something like that. And then you say, JavaScript, could you take this div and could you start managing it? And this is, this is a, an application. Um, but of course, there's no reason at all why you have to do this only once. You can do this as many times as you like in the front end. And this is what we've actually done. So we've got our original application, which was written in AngularJS, still live. It's still running. It's serving customers. It's got loads of stuff in. I mean, it's, it's like half a million lines of code or something. Throwing it away would be a, would be a shame. Uh, so that, that still exists. But next to it, we've built other applications. And we've attached those to other portions of the DOM. They're, they're not always loaded. You don't just load a bunch of applications and have them running all the time. You, you, you orchestrate it. So you have a single central orchestration tool, which chooses which applications to load and which to render. Um, so you don't have to you know, pile a bunch of JavaScript in. You, you, you pile in the correct amount of JavaScript to make the app that you need. And this means, of course, that each of these applications can be built in whatever we like. So we're not tied to the technology of two years ago or three years ago. We're tied to the technology of right now. We build a new application. We just pick the, the latest thing, which at the moment is React uh, with... Um, uh, uh, with um, oh, what's it? I can't remember the things. Yeah, the, yeah, for styling. It'll come back to me. Anyway, um, this, is, um, this is the bathtub. So we call it the bathtub uh, because it's a spa. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. It's one of our uh, old developers came up with this. And this is our orchestration tool here. So I'm going to show you inside this in a minute. I'll show you the actual code and, and, and how this thing works. It's really, really simple. So we have our different ap applications. These are down the bottom here, application one, application two, and application three. And in, in practice, these correspond to things like the grid or the top navigation bar. These are a separate application. Or the, uh, the profile, which is a thing that slides in from the side and shows you a profile for a single candidate. Or like the settings app. This is separate. Of course, settings app, you never load it. You don't need to most of the time. Um, so we build these. And these are basic generic apps. Most of them are React, but some of them are core JavaScript, and one of them is AngularJS. Um, and the React apps range in uh, you know, tech level from you know, React of two years ago to React right now. Um, and that's actually fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, um, a, 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 as long as the code is working, we can live with it being a little bit older. So for each of these apps, to get this into the bathtub, we have to build an adapter down here. So we build an adapter here that we export just using... Um, uh, ES6 modules. Uh, and, and the adapter has three functions. It has a bootstrap function, it has a mount function, it has an unmount function. And the job of the bootstrap function is to bring it into existence. So the first time it might run, want to run some things and bring itself up. Um, then we have the mount function, and the mount function sticks it in the DOM and makes it start rendering DOM. Then the unmount function here does the opposite. It takes it out of the DOM, makes it disappear, and makes it stop listening. Then for each of these in the bathtub, we have a little adapter, which is a tiny piece of code, really the smallest piece of code you can imagine. It has two functions inside of it. The first is a loader. And this knows how to load the code from the internet. 
So it says, okay, well, go and get that code from the network and make it available in the front end. And then it has a router. So you might think this is some sort of clever router. It's not. This router is just a function. It's a function that returns true or it returns false. And if it returns true, um, the bathtub is going to check to see if it's loaded. If it's not loaded, it will go and load it. This is all done with promises. It loads it, makes it available. As soon as it's loaded, it's going to bootstrap it. If it's not already bootstrapped, then it will mount it in the DOM. If, uh, if the router returns false, it does the opposite. It unmounts it. And then from then on, you can just mount and unmount and mount and unmount as, as you navigate around, around the application. Does that make sense? Um, so I'm going to dive into some code now. So this is the actual code of, of our actual application just here, running in Visual Studio Code, as you can see. Um, so this, um, this is a bathtub adapter just here. You can see it's got a loader and it's got a router. Uh, this, is the code that's, this is the code that sits just here, uh, in, inside the bathtub. Uh, so the loader um, is this function just here. As you can see, this is just a, a, it's a short promise chain. Does this make sense? If you look at this code, can you, can, you, can you more or less understand it? You can see it exports this ES6 function just here uh, that does five things. First of all, it shows the spinner. So it starts the spinner going on the page. Um, then it lazy loads an application from the internet. So this is lazy.load. This is a piece of code which we've written. It's, it's really simple. It just goes and gets the code and makes it available. Uh, then it checks this thing called the ACL. So the ACL just checks that the user is actually allowed to rent to see this app um, just here. And then once, once it's loaded the code and made sure the user is allowed to see the app, it shows the spinner. And then it makes this, uh, this code available. And this is one of the dark, the dark secrets of, uh, of passing data back and forth between different JavaScript files in the front end. You need globals. So this is actually exposing a global here uh, on window.beamery. Um, you can forget you saw that if you like. I don't mind. <laughs> Uh, I, honestly, I, I tried for a week to avoid that, but that was the only one. Um, and then this is the router. So look at this. This is so simple. So this, uh, this router is just a function. It receives location, which is just window.location. And then it returns true or false. So first of all, it's making sure that, the, uh, uh, that this application is actually allowed. So it's checking the ACL. Beamery 5 is enabled or not enabled, so we can turn it on and off for different customers. Um, and then it checks to see if the location hash starts with um, this location. We're we using hash-based routing. Yes. Yo, yes, 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 of course. Thank you for saying. How's that? Cool. Um, so this is, um, this is our adapter. This is this portion of the application here. So now these, these applications down here, these are, these are simple apps. These are... Uh, these are JavaScript applications, or they're React applications. I'll show you a, a plain JavaScript adapter down here, first of all. So this, um, uh, this, is, this is a bathtub adapter for a thing called the, uh, the, the, um, the toaster. Uh, the toaster app is an app that shows little toasts at the bottom of the page, and it's shared by all the other apps, and they just sort of lay over the top of things. So it's got three functions in here. You can see it's got the bootstrap function, the mount function, and the unmount function. And look how simple these are. This just shells out to the app and tells the app to bootstrap itself, bring itself into existence. And in fact, in the toaster app, all this does is it sets uh, uh, bootstrap equals true. As, as, as simple as that. Um, then we have this mount, which just uh, gets a DOM node here using this function, and then, uh, and then renders the app. Here it is, uh, app.mount. And then we do the unmount is the opposite, so it just unmounts the application. So this is, this is a simple JavaScript example for a simple little JavaScript app which we run. Um, but we have more complicated ones here. And actually, we didn't want to write these more complicated ones here ourselves, so we used a framework. Um, this is one for React. Um, and we're, we're not actually the first people to come up with this. This, has come up, this, was, this was invented by a company called um, Canopy Tax in America, uh, who we are, we are friends with. And they have this thing called Single Spa. Um, so we're using here single spa react um, and again this is just a uh, uh, this is just a react um, application it has a component which we call the bridge just here which is the root application and he called it the bridge I have no idea why uh, um, and uh, it has a bootstrap function which bootstraps it a mount function and an unmount function and then at the end of it it just exposes this thing globally and you can see, just given these little tiny pieces of wire, we can wire together completely separate apps. 
we, we're not stuck to, um, to React. You know, in two years' time, React is going to be legacy, right? Nobody will like Flux anymore. We'll look at Redux and say, why the heck did we do that? Just as we did with everything that's come before. Um, uh, but when that day comes, we'll be able to use whatever is new. We'll be able to use the newer framework, and that will be fine. We'll just run them side by side. We won't throw away any of the work which we've done. Um, and everyone will be happy. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about communicating between apps. Because this is the thing that everyone always asks. Uh, this is the question everyone always asks. So how do these apps actually talk to each other? Because apps, you know, you've got all these apps running side by side in the DOM, and you, they actually sometimes they do need to share data, right? You, know, you need to know, you know which thing to highlight, or you, know, you need to pass some object from one thing to another. So the, the first thing that we wanted to avoid was uh, direct communication between apps. So we, we've got these four apps here, and you can imagine we could actually just have these apps call methods on each other. It's possible, because they're all in the DOM, and they're all in the global namespace. So you could actually just call methods on, on other apps, and, and, and this works. You, you can do that if you want. But the problem with that is that you start to create things like this, and this, and pretty soon you have a knot. You have a spider's web, which is a bad structure. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a second option. Can anyone think of what that second option might be? Yeah. Service. Use a service, yes. Service, or oh, there's another name for a service. Anyone? A singleton, yes, yeah, singleton. You could use uh, all, all, all of these things are basically what I'm going to say next, which is a global flux store. A single central object like this. Uh, you could use Redux, or you could use, use whatever you like. And you could have all of these apps talking to this flux store, so you push data and they subscribe to it. So you push data to this, and this app subscribes to it and gets to change. And this works. You can actually do this. We originally actually did this. Um, but again, if you do this, you have dependencies between these applications. And if you've got dependencies, it makes it difficult to deploy one app without deploying another. So say so, so I'm working on app one. I want to push app one. Well, if I push app one, I have to also push the flux store. Maybe the flux store has dependencies and other things. So then I have to push app two. And you end up having to push more than one piece of code at the same time. You can't just, you, know, um, uh, you can't have independent teams working on their own stuff. I think I've, yes, that's better. Um, so we didn't go down this route. It was a route we explored, but we didn't do it. We actually ended up doing something much simpler. So we just used the address bar. The address bar is effectively a global object, right? It's accessible from everything. It's a single central router. So for example, if the grid wants to show a profile, we just use a query string. We say query string profile ID equals, and then the, uh, the bathtub says, OK, well, there's a query string there, so I'm going to turn the, uh, the profile app on. And the profile app comes into existence and says, oh, yeah, there's, the, there's a query string there. I'm going to take that as an ID. And it downloads the data to render a profile in the sidebar. Now, this works for small things like strings or IDs. And actually, this is 90% of the cases, this works just fine. But 10%, it doesn't. So for the 10%, and this is actually something that we're, we're still working on, we use sockets. So you can push data up, you can push an object up, and then you can subscribe to that socket somewhere else. And this is something that we're actively building at this point in time. And because we're actively building it, we also actually have a temporary thing in place. I don't know if you can see that, uh, which we call mockets. It's down the bottom there, sorry. Uh, which is just like a pretend sockets in the browser. It's, it's, it's effectively like a, a, a micro implementation of sockets, which we're pretending is sockets for now until we can get the sockets up there. Um, and that's it. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to bring Jason back up, and we've got a bit of time for questions. Do we have time for questions? How long do we have? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes for questions, apparently. Does anyone? Yes. So uh, you're saying that you can put uh, applications side by side. Yes. Doesn't that limit your design space? So, I mean, don't you want to have some kind of hierarchy? Um, some sort of hierarchy. Well, I mean, you can have whatever hierarchy you like. Uh, well, like things inside other things. Well, I mean, if, if, if you're having things inside other things, probably that's an app with components. Um, so you, 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 you'll, you'll make a single app, and it will have components inside of it. We, we don't nest apps inside other apps. Uh, we could. There's actually, there's actually no reason why you couldn't mount an app inside a div that's supplied by another app. It's, 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 it's practical. But you, I think we'd end up in knots. Um, so in, in, in terms of design, 
they do sit next to each other. I've got um, a, sort of, uh, that's sort of a picture. Can you see that? It's a bit small. Uh, but we've got, um, we've got a div here, which is a grid, and this renders the grid. We've got a div at the top here, which is a top bar, one down the side. These are separate apps. And then this thing here is actually a separate app. So they do, we've architected it such that they sit side by side. Um, I take your point. I mean, you can, of course, nest things inside each other, but typically to do that, you would, you would just set it up so they were actually in the DOM next to each other. Uh, what are the considerations around performance, standalone different frameworks and libraries? Uh, yeah, so the performance, it, it does suffer. Um, so, for example, when you do load up the page. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so it, it, JavaScript is pretty fast, so it doesn't suffer that badly, but it does like raise the lower the performance by a, a bit compared to if there was one single application. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in practice, not, not noticeably. Um, you, you obviously have more code loaded, and more code gets loaded over time. So in terms of memory, you are actually using more memory probably than if you just had one application. Um, but you know, if, if you're using React, you've got the, uh, the virtual DOM. The virtual DOM is only monitoring the portion of the DOM which it's assigned to. It doesn't monitor the whole DOM. So if they're sit sitting side by side, you only have a virtual DOM for this bit and a virtual DOM for this bit. Um, uh, it, yeah. Um, and also, you get the performance benefit of only downloading the code you need. So you have this app, or you have this app. You have the suite of apps which you actually want. Yeah, so there are some things you can do. So say, for example, you've got React. Um, you can have lazy loading inside your React application as well. So for the different components, um, for example, we were creating a profile page. Um, we only downloaded the first page of the profile. And then if you click on the different tabs, it will download different parts of that. So um, you can optimize the inside of the applications as well as the lazy loading on the top. So you can add lazy loading to, like, to two layers, if that makes sense. Yeah, you sort of talk about flux a little bit. Yes. A single flux store, this, this architecture just here. Um, so um, a, a, a design principle here was that we wanted different teams. We originally just had one big team and everybody working on the same code base all the time. And actually that becomes really difficult as you scale. Uh, so we wanted different teams to own different bits of the code base and have those code bases completely isolated such that one team, like Team Rocket for example, can deliver code at one stage, and Team Iceberg can deliver code at another stage, and all they have to do to deliver code is just push it to a CDN. And that's actually what we have now. You just, if it's front-end code, you just put it on the CDN, and that's fine. Uh, if we have this connection just here, and th this application suddenly starts sort of storing a different sort of data here, or it changes the shape of the data. I see. So, so one team will be able to push their change? Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I mean in terms of code delivery, yes, rather than uh, passing data around, yes. Any other questions? Uh, communication between uh, different parts. So mm -hmm. Why do you think like uh, WebSocket would be better suited than the standard custom events, I guess? Uh, over custom events? Yeah, they, they could just emit custom events and listen to each other. Like events inside the browser itself? Yeah, just, you just emit a custom event and then other ones will just subscribe to it and then they could just... Yeah, and this is, this is effectively actually what this Mockets is, which is actually is, is a bit far down for you to see. Uh, we, we do actually communicate between them using a sort of a pub-sub architecture where you can push objects and then other things subscribe to that, which, which is similar to, to, to global events. The, the trouble with global events is you tend to get a bit, a bit of a disconnect between different portions. So something is emitting an event, and then something else is receiving it, and it's like, well, actually, I, I sort of don't know what's emitting it and what's receiving it. And you can't sort of see very easily what's, where, how, how the data is flowing around. It's sort of, it, just sort of, it, it goes off into the ether and then it comes back down from the ether somewhere else. Um, which I suppose you also have to an extent with WebSockets. Uh, one of the advantages of, with WebSockets is you can have multiple people working on the same uh, information at the same time. So if you have, uh, I mean, we have thousands of users all editing um, candidates. And if two, pe two people edit the same candidate at the same time, with WebSockets, we can, we can merge that data, like Google Apps. Uh, so we, two people can, can do the same thing, which is why we're sort of aiming to do this. And also it adds another layer of abstraction between the two. It discourages people from 
making apps talk to one another, which is another sort of, I don't know, it's a social engineering principle. Is it not like then you have to make a server call just to communicate between two parts of the, the app, but mm. they just directly talk to each other? It slows it down just a little, yeah. Uh, I get your point. It's something we've agonized over. Uh, we may not keep it, but it's what we've got at the moment. That's a good point, though. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, it was uh, something similar. Like, why, uh, if you can give an example of a use case where you need to use the website as opposed to just the routing, uh, the address bar, or uh, like the, the browser's memory? Um, I think WebSockets web sockets are good, for example, if we had a phone application or something in the future. It's kind of agnostic. So if we had PubNub or something similar to that, we could just integrate an application. Um, if we had a, an Android or an iOS application, we could just send a message via PubNub um, instead of just communicate. If we were communicating via the browser, we wouldn't be able to do that, if that makes sense. How do you strategize writing tests for such applications? Oh. Do you do them independently or like, is there a common <laughs> Good question. That's a difficult one, yes. Uh, so yeah, independently we have unit tests. Uh, so each, each app is independently unit tested. We also have um, uh, Storybook, which shows and introduced, which oh, yeah. really works really well. So the way we normally um, approach creating a, uh, an application in React is we start off with creating all of the components in Storybook. Mm -hmm. um, so we create um, these modular um, stateless uh, components, and then we test all of those individually. Um, and also Storybook can show you the test for each component. So we, we do that for, all of, for most of our React applications. Um, and then on top of that, we've got other layers of testing as well. Yeah, so then we have end-to-end -end testing as well. The end-to-end -end testing is, uh, is work in progress. I don't know if anyone else has that. Uh, yeah, um, we, we have quite a few end-to-end -end tests, but it's, it's not finished by any means. So that's written in Java, just using regular old uh, Selenium. Uh, so it just... Yeah, brings, brings up an app and clicks around. Does that mean that there would be some components which you know, don't pass some, some of the tests and which somehow fail the test and the fail still applicable still fail on your application? Oh, so when you put the component into the context of the whole application? Uh, I mean, that's, that's theoretically possible, although in theory, each component is isolated. Yeah, we, we don't, yeah, apart from those globals I, saw you, I showed you before, we don't use globals. So each one is an object, and they have objects, and they have objects. So they, don't, they shouldn't, in theory, interact. And we haven't so far noticed them doing so. But there are sometimes interactions, like SAS, for example. We have some global SAS from the legacy app that sometimes bites us. It's a problem. If we wanted to test um, something like a, a grid where it needs um, information from another application, we would just mock that data instead of requiring the other one. Yeah. So it shouldn't interfere. Yeah. Yes. When do you run those units? Do you set about pushing code changes straight to yeah. Do you run the unit test on every, every one of those deploys or? Good question. What do you do, Jason? Uh, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, so we should do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we use Husky. So we use it on pre commit, pre push. Um, we try not to know verify. Um, <laughs> and we do it um, via GitLab as well, so that does it as well. So we, we try to do it as much as possible. And yeah. about the end -point? Uh, I think that's, yeah, that's, sure yeah, that's run before we deploy to live, yeah. and then to end test go, because they take a long time. Yeah. But the unit tests, in theory, ideally, uh, we're running the unit tests as we're developing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes we do that, sometimes not. It depends. Does that mean that end-to-end -end tests have to download the information for the other apps? Yeah. So the end-to-end -end test instantiates an entire DOM. Yeah. Uh, so you're not testing individual applications. You instantiate, you're testing a browser that loads applications. Yeah, they're all different repos, but they're all built and deployed to a, to a CDN. So it just pulls from the CDN, pulls, pulls the built code, and we test that. Are you sharing components between apps? Like, you like components? Yes. Jason? Yeah, so we have a, a shared library, and we just, in, we just um, import that. And if we need any um, components, we just use those. Um, Oh, sorry, sorry, no, no. In, in theory, you can do that. Um, we, we actually, in, in, to start with, um, checked out whether or not we could use, um, oh, what's its name? Component. Web components, thank you, yes. We looked at web components, but we found them a little flaky and not quite ready. Uh, but we could um, at some point in the future. But actually, we have a React library that has React components, and we have an Angular one that's separate, that looks similar. Uh, so we have two separate ones at this point. 
Um, and we also have a shared SAS library as well called Runic that has all the, all the, the borders and the colors and the widths and the heights and things uh, that we can reuse um, in other apps. It's a good question. Uh, there was a question over here. Yes? Um, how much state are you storing in the address bar? Is it enough to be worried about hitting the character? No, <laughs> we don't. Uh, we don't have to worry about it. What's the character? It's, it's like, two, is it 4,000? Yeah, but that's on, that's on IE. I mean, I think it's a lot larger than that on, uh, in, um, in Chrome. We don't actually support IE, we're lucky. It's quite a lot, it's around 30,000. Yeah, yeah, we would never, we'd never get close to that. We're just storing strings, not objects. We don't serialize objects into the address bar, just, just strings and IDs. But people still use IE, unfortunately. Yeah, luckily because we're making an app, we just get to tell people they're not allowed. Which is naughty, I know, but... Um. Yeah, we wouldn't really hit the limit because we would do things like, uh, if we have a, a profile component, it would, we would just pass in the ID for the profile, not all the, profile, not all the information that the profile needs. So with the ID, it would just download all the profile's information. Did you consider using local storage to store that kind of information? Uh, we do use local storage in some places. Um, yeah, we use a mixture of different paths, but it, I don't... I don't think you can use that between the different applications. You may be able to. You can. Oh, so we do use it in some places. Yeah. That's a bit naughty and probably not right. But yeah, we, we do actually <laughs> sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I actually disagree with that. Yeah. So the idea is to keep things as modular as possible. Um, that's why we try and avoid doing that. Cool. Thank you all very much. Yeah.